Well, that's the theme song, and you know what comes after the theme song, don't you? You do. You know what's coming. I call it a little thing called the simultaneous sip. Now, if you were prepared or lucky, you have your beverage with you, and it's time for the simultaneous sip. Oh, extra good today. I don't know why. Why is it extra good? Is it because North Korea is starting to talk nice? Is it because it's a sunny day, at least in California? It's all of those things. But today, I'm going to give you a uh, persuasion lesson. I'm going to wrap it around the issue of how to avoid getting your ass kicked by the police. Now, the bigger picture is I'm going to teach you a number of techniques. These are things you've seen before, but I'm going to bring them together into one uh, useful presentation. Uh, but it might also keep somebody from getting their ass kicked by the police. Now, after I tweeted that I was going to talk about this topic, or that I might, uh, folks retweeted to me that this idea has already been done by Chris Rock. And so I looked at a uh, YouTube video of Chris Rock, who did a very funny, I recommend it, it's very funny, uh, send up of people doing the wrong things during a traffic stop and then getting their ass kicked by police. So Chris Rock's take on it was both hilarious and weirdly useful because it was just saying, don't, don't do stuff like disobey the police, don't run, don't, don't resist arrest, don't have a crazy friend with you in the car who can't sh shut up. So it was hilarious and useful. But I'm going to take it to another level. I'm going to take it to the subtle level where the, the person who gets their ass beat is not doing terrible things, but they're doing things that are suboptimal, things that get them in trouble. Now, I'm going to use the Sterling Brown uh, example. If you haven't seen the police cam video of a police officer stopping uh, NBA star uh, Sterling Brown for a parking violation, and then it turns into uh, he gets tased, I want to break that down a little bit. Uh, you don't need to watch it while we're doing this. If you've seen it before, it would help. If you watch it after, it would help more. But I'll, I'll tell you the important parts. So the setup here is that, uh, so Sterling Brown, and it, it, it matters what he looks like for this story, all right? So the physicality of the people involved does matter for persuasion. So he's a six foot six, 23 year old African American male with, a, with, I think he had his hood up initially. And he had a, a high-end sports car, or not a sports car, but a high-end car. And I believe that the initial problem was that he, he parked across either one or two handicap zones to walk into a convenience store, I think. And he was only going to be there for a minute and comes out. When he comes out, a police officer you know, is there, and already the police officer has an attitude. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that I just watched a, a police training expert look at the, the video, and even the police expert said this police officer made mistakes that did lead to the tasing. That was also my take. When I watched it, I thought, whoa, this police officer rolled up with an attitude. If you roll up with an attitude, you influence the other person toward your attitude. This is a universal truth, and you should learn this. People don't independently have feelings. Sometimes they do. If they're just sitting in a room thinking about something, they can have an independent feeling. But most of our feelings are somewhat viral. I can make you feel differently by changing my own feeling. I can directly influence your reaction by what my emotional state is, because people pick up on other people's emotional state. So this cop had an attitude and rolled up with an attitude. The moment he expressed his attitude, what did 23-year-old, remember, this is very young, 23-year-old. You know, some people say your brain isn't even done until you're 25, right? Or at least fully formed. He rolled, so the police officer rolls up with an attitude, right? 
police officer f- should not have had the attitude. He created a situation in which the person he was talking to would absorb some of the attitude and maybe reflect it back, which is exactly what happened. Now, let's back up one level. Sterling Brown did a very small infraction. If you're looking at you know, the history of the world, he, he uh, parked across either one or two handicap zones in a place where there was plenty of space and he was just there for a minute. He probably just didn't want his car to be dinged or it was just convenient. It was a little careless, it was thoughtless, but as crimes go, tiny, tiny little traffic infraction. But what did he do seriously wrong on a persuasion level? Like really, really wrong? He parked across handicap parking with a high-end car. What are the odds that when this police officer rolled up, that the police officer himself either has a family member who, who needs handicap parking, or knows somebody, or cares about people who have disabilities? You, the, so even though the crime itself is tiny, 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 you know, practically insignificant, the emotional feeling that it triggers in anybody who sees you do it with a high-end car, because that's what makes it worse, it's the high-end car, right? Uh, that is going to trigger people. All right. So Sterling Brown, terrible mistake on the persuasion level. He did something that is almost guaranteed to cause an emotional, irrational reaction, even in a trained police officer. Big mistake, okay? Small crime, big mistake. Uh, So he starts talking to him, and I guess the first thing that the police officer uh, asked him to do was to back up a little bit, because the guy, uh, Sterling is six foot six, I don't know how big the cop is, probably much, much less big. Not only is Sterling Brown 6'6", but he's a world-class athlete and he's 23, right? You could even forget about, you know, forget about the African-American part and whatever bias that might bring with it for the police officer. We don't even have to know if there is any, right? Just being 6'6", 23, and, and strapped, you know, like just a big athletic guy, puts a police officer immediately on the defensive because there's a, a physical potential for danger just by the size. So a police officer asks him to back up and he backs up like an inch or three inches or something and then that becomes a thing. So, so immediately Sterling starts um, cooperating but not fully. And at one point he, didn't take his, he wouldn't take his hands out of his pockets and that was the part that got him taken to the ground and, and ultimately uh, tased. So he didn't back up. He argued with the, the police officer. He did not ever agree with the police officer about the infraction being something that mattered. He kept playing it off like, oh, I was just going to be there for a minute. Complete mistake. The first thing you do is you agree with the police officer even if he's wrong. Yeah, you show respect, you agree. So I'll give you, I'll give you the, the fuller... A solution in a moment. Um, so this was a case with two people doing everything wrong, right? So if you're trying to figure out who was wrong, I've watched the tape several times and I agree with the police uh, training expert who says the cop definitely rolled up with the wrong attitude and and certainly created a situation that was more dangerous than it needed to. Then the next thing that happened was a little bit accidental, but made things much worse. And this is what happened. So the police officer fairly early on calls for backup, presuming he's just going to need you know one extra car. Now, I don't know if, if it just happened by coincidence that there were a lot of cars in the area, but several police officers roll up. Now, if you're a police officer, and you roll up and there, there's only one other person there talking to one person, it looks peaceful, you say to yourself, ah, I don't have much to do. I'm just sort of the backup guy in case things go down wrong. But if you're the third car there and you see all of this police presence, what are you persuaded to think? Suddenly, this thing that was sort of a nothing 
looks to you like it's a big deal, simply because there were so many police cars there. So everybody takes what was the small deal, and in their mind they inflate it up just because there's so many cops there. So many guns, so many people, so much testosterone. And so everything about this situation led to exactly what happened. Everybody did the wrong thing, right? The, the extra police officers who rolled up, you know, the last two cars could have turned around and done something else once they checked to see that things were under control. Um, I'm not sure that that makes sense police-wise, but the point is that that big police presence caused people's minds to think there's a big problem when there wasn't. Uh, not yet, anyway. All right. So I promised you that I would tell you uh, one sentence that would keep people from uh, being having their ass kicked by the police. And here's the important part. Even if the police officer is not doing his or her job correctly. Now, I want to talk to you about what I call loser think. There are a set of beliefs that people have that cause them to think in a way that just is very unproductive. I saw one of them on Twitter just moments ago. Uh, I saw a journalist criticizing Elon Musk, who had talked about maybe creating a website to check the credibility of journalists. And the journalist was pushing back and saying, have you spent any time in a newsroom? And then the journalist made this point. He said, uh, let me read the exact quote. He said, uh, Elon, I'm asking you a question. When was the last time you were in a newsroom with a reporter who was reporting on something other than you or your companies? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Just like Rocky Ships, first-hand knowledge is critical in knowing how to fix things. So first-hand knowledge is critical in knowing how to fix things. This comes from the reporter who has a reporter's job. He's talking to Elon frickin' Musk, who is world famous for creating huge, successful companies, maybe not as profitable as they should be, but successful by most of our, our metrics, uh, in businesses that he didn't know anything about. He was part of PayPal without being a banker. He started an electric car company when all the electric car companies said they couldn't do it. He's got a boring company that makes tunnels. What the hell did he know about tunnels? He's, now he's got, a, he's got literally a rocket ship in space. You know, maybe going to Mars someday. And I don't think he was an expert in any of those things. So I tweeted back that this advice that you have to have firsthand uh, knowledge before you, you weigh in on something, that's the sort of thing that would, would have prevented Steve Jobs from creating Apple, would have prevented Bill Gates from creating Microsoft, would have created Elon Musk from doing any of his businesses, would have created me, stopped me from creating um, Dilbert. So... The number of people who have done things in areas which are not their their detailed knowledge is pretty is pretty long, and so I said maybe I would upgrade that to thinking to say that uh, first-hand knowledge can be doesn't always have to be, but first-hand knowledge can be a mental prison. Look how many times the people who have the detailed knowledge can't see a way out, because the detailed knowledge does form a little bit of a a little bit of a, a prison. The person who doesn't know anything doesn't have that prison. Here's the best example you're ever going to get. The founder of uh, Uber. Uh, I, I once talked to him and said, um, how did you know that you could create Uber when everybody else thought that was impossible because the law didn't allow it? You know, the law gave uh, special rights to cab taxi cab owners you can't just start your own taxi service just because you want to. The law doesn't allow it. How did you know that this impossible barrier, that the company you're starting is illegal, how did you know you could get past that? And you know what he said to me? We didn't know that. Right? They didn't know it was illegal. Uber didn't know that Uber was illegal when they started the company. Now, I'm talking about the very first days. I'm not talking about, you know, it, it must have been very soon that they realized they had this big problem with the law, but it didn't stop them. They'd already started the company. Now, if they had not already started the company when they found out that there was this legal problem, would they have started the company? 
I don't believe so. I believe that somebody who had detailed knowledge of the cab business would not have started Uber because they would have known too much. See the problem? They would have been in a mental prison. Here's another mental prison, getting back to my main point today, about um, how to keep yourself from being beat up by the police. All right. Um, Just finishing up on that point, one of the things I talk about all the time is that one of the loser think um, biggest problems in the world is to think that the source of the problem also has to be the solution. Let's say you believe that the source of police brutality is that the police do things wrong or that they're biased or they're, they're racist. Let's say you believe that. You don't, you don't need to say that's true for our purposes today. Just let's say you believe that. If you also believe that because the problem is the police are doing things wrong, therefore the solution is that the police must do something differently, that's loser think. Right? It would be great if the police did something differently and that fixed the problem. That's my first choice. I would love the people who cause problems to also be the people who fix them. But that's a loser perspective. Right? It's a loser perspective. You fix problems you can fix. Period. Doesn't matter who caused them. Right? You fix problems you can fix for you or for whoever you're trying to help, independent of who caused the problem. This is critical if you're stopped by the police and the police officer is a gigantic asshole to you. And you say to yourself, well, the problem here is this police officer is being a gigantic asshole to me. He, he needs to do something differently. All right, you're going to get your ass kicked. You're stupid. You have not, you have not developed a good uh, strategy for staying alive. All right. So the first thing you do is you say, what can I do to use persuasion to keep myself safe? Even if the police officer is not doing the right stuff, that's how to look at this. That's the winner perspective. Winner perspective is what can I do? How can I control the situation? I don't care if other people are doing stuff wrong. What can I do to make this good? And I'm going to teach you one persuasive method that uses a whole crap ton of persuasion technique in seven words. Yeah, seven words. Why did I choose seven words, you ask yourself? Kanye West. I'll talk about this in a moment. Do you remember when Kanye uh, did the tweet that just broke the world? And uh, I believe that it was... Uh, I like the way Candace Owens thinks. I like the way Candace Owens thinks. Seven words. Does that matter? Does it matter that it was seven words? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Here's why. If it were longer, it would be harder to repeat, harder to remember, a little less viral. So nine words would have been too long. Here's another trick. If you're a creative person in a lot of different realms, there is something that people's minds prefer about odd numbers. We prefer one, three, five, and seven over two, four, six, and eight. Why? Why do we prefer that? Why, why is there some creative preference to that? Don't know. Doesn't matter. It's just one of those things that people observe uh, that people like odd numbers. If you're going to put some trees in your backyard and you're saying to yourself, huh, should I put, you know, two trees here or three? The answer is three. Trust me, three will look better than two because we like odd numbers. Our minds are just wired that way. Now, if Kanye had taken his seven perfect um, words, and reduced it to say, you know, three or one or something, it might not have been enough. So you need enough, but not too many. Now, why do I look to people like Kanye for this sort of creative, you know, guidance? It's frickin' Kanye West. He is 
uh, bona fide, you know, legitimate, creative genius with words, right? If somebody who does something super viral uh, is also a genius in doing things like that, which is writing lyrics, writing things that people, you know, st- the things that stick in your mind and things that can move you. If you see somebody do that, it pays to stop and say, all right, what's he doing? You know, why does this work? Why doesn't it? And one of the reasons it works is because it's just about the right length and it's an odd number. So I actually crafted this to put it into seven words, partly as a, you know, sort of a, let's, let's call it a, a, a poetic repayment, maybe an homage to, to Kanye's um, work. So <clears throat> here's a statement that I propose to you. No one would ever get in trouble with the police if they use this as the first thing they say to the police officer. Now, you don't need to remember the exact words. You could, you could you know, get there with other ways. But I'll explain to you why this is so powerful. And the, the sentence is, how can we stay safe today, officer? Imagine saying that the first thing that happens when the officer rolls up to you. Now, let me tell you why that's so powerful. You're thinking to yourself, Scott, this is kind of obvious. You know, doing, you know, being polite to a police officer, obvious. Well, yeah, that part is obvious. Doing what the police officer tells you, obvious. Yeah, that's obvious. But I'm going to take you to another level. All right. So you're doing all the obvious stuff, being polite, doing what you're told, keeping your hands where they're shown, don't make any aggressive movements. You're doing all that stuff right. But beyond that, there's a whole other level of persuasion. So here's what they are. Uh, One of the strongest levels of persuasion is saying what somebody's thinking as they're thinking it. This works in all kinds of realms. If you know because of the situation that somebody is probably thinking a very specific thought and then you call it out at the moment they think it, it's a very bonding thing. So what is the police officer thinking when he rolls up? How do I stay safe? So you're saying what the police officer is thinking at the exact moment he's thinking it. Boom. Immediate bonding. Okay? Now you and the police officer, you you just immediately got on the same page. That's just one of the parts of persuasion that's here. That's just one. Right? It's pacing and leading. Pacing and leading, you can influence another person by first matching what they are doing or caring about until they get trust with you, and then you can start leading them, and they'll follow you, because we're on the same page, right? Controlling attention is very important in persuasion. It doesn't matter that you've got a great argument if nobody's paying attention to it. Our brains are irrational. The things we focus on the most, the things we pay attention to, are the things that become important to us. They're the things we act on. Focus and attention is important. What does this sentence do? It focuses you on safety. Boom! First impression. Safety. When, you, when a police officer walks up to a situation which could be dangerous, and the very first per- thing that comes out of your mouth is safety, boom! Focus. That's the top priority, and you're both thinking about it at the same time. Um, thinking past the sale. I've talked about this one. You want, you want somebody to think past the the part you're trying to persuade them. What are you trying to persuade them? Safety. Safety is the sale. We're going to be safe today. How do you make them think past that? How do we do it? You've already decided you're going to be safe. Safety is a given. You've already talked past it. How do we become safe today? Because it's, you know, how to do it today. All right? So you're making you think past the sale. First impression in persuasion. The first impression is really hard to, to get out of somebody's head. What was the first impression that the police officer gave? That he was an asshole. That was, that was the first impression that the police officer gave. That he was going to be a jerk. Now, did that police officer have a pretty good reason to be tweaked? Yeah, he saw a high-end um, car... In other words, somebody who's, you know, in a good situation in life, parking across a handicapped spot. 
Your job is to protect the weak against you know the powerful in a way as a police officer, um, and you see this and it probably really tweaked him. All right, I can imagine a lot of people would have had exactly the same reaction as a police officer. So he didn't manage his first impression and it cost him, right? Because the police officer is not having a good day from this either, right? There were no winners in this. The police officer didn't win. You know, his career takes a hit too. Um, and then what was the first impression that Sterling Brown gave back to the police officer? Resistance. A little bit of resistance. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't really, you know, terribly uh, important. But that was the first impression. Once that's in his head, hard to get it out. Compared to first impression, talking about safety. All right. Pattern persuasion. The pattern doesn't appear the first time you use it. The pattern appears if lots of people use this. Imagine if you're a police officer and you start to hear this. You know, you've, you've stopped a number of people and let's say three or four of them have said this. And then that three or four people who have said this, you have a totally good interaction with them. What happens the next time the police officer hears this and they start talking about it? They go, oh, I'm probably a lot safer with this person because people who say that, my pattern recognition says things go well. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, hey, but what about... What about if the bad guys figure this out and then they say that to the police officer to you know take his suspicions down and then they pull out their gun? Well, I think you should trust the police to follow their own procedures for safety. They, of course, know that people lie. They know that people cheat. But uh, so they're going to be ready. They're going to have the hand on the gun on the right situations. They're going to have you know enough space under the right situations, etc. cetera. Uh, so trust the police to know that there's always a risk that somebody's tricking them. But if you create this pattern persuasion over time, this, this just gets more powerful. All right. Let's talk about ego as a tool. I've told you that the greatest persuaders and President Trump, I put in this category, use their egos as a tool when they need a lot of ego, such as running for president of the United States, campaigning, you ramp up your ego and you say, I'm the greatest, I'm the best, I, I can do things, I'm amazing. It's good to ramp up your ego in that situation. But if you're having a sensitive conversation with Kim Jong-un about meeting to denuclearize the planet, then you dial back your ego a little bit. You say, I'd like to be your friend. You know, hope this works out. All right. So if you use your ego as a tool, you can say safe. If you, if you believe your ego is who you are, then you get offended by things that are going to get your ass kicked. Uh, the police officer in the case with Sterling Brown, his ego, I think, was sort of in play. Sterling Brown, I think his ego was in play. We can't read minds, but if you looked at the actions of the people, you have to at least suspect the ego was not being used as a tool. Had Sterling Brown used ego as a tool instead of thinking who, it, who he was, he would have said to himself, oh, darn, this police officer's got an attitude. I better dial back my ego. Stay safe. He didn't do that. He, didn't, he did, probably didn't think of it as a tool, but that's something you need to learn. Um, the high ground. I've told you that the most powerful, probably, most powerful persuasion beyond fear. Fear is always the best motivator if it's enough fear. But if you want to persuade somebody, take them to the high ground where even they agree that's where you should be having the conversation. That's what makes it work. A good high ground move uh, makes the other person impossible to stay where they were. Right? So the low ground here is, you know, what did I do wrong? Am I going to get a ticket? You know, may, Maybe, maybe, you know, I shouldn't have done this, but, you know, it was only, I was only in there for a minute. That's the low ground. So, um, Sterling Brown started right off in the weeds. The weeds are, he said, oh, I, I thought I was only going to be in the store for a minute. I came right back out. Weeds, weeds, weeds. Do you ever win in the weeds? No, you do not. Because the other person just argues weeds. He's like, no, you know, you were more, you were there more than a minute. That could be the, the least important conversation of all time is the exact amount of minutes 
he was in that store was it one or four minutes all right that's weeds this sentence takes you out of the weeds boom what is the top priority for a police officer safety what do both of those people want in the situation where the police officer stops you safety who argues with safety no one who wants to talk about whether it was one minute or four minutes that you were in the store once you've taken them to the high ground of safety nobody nobody wants to be the idiot who's who's arguing in the weeds because if you take somebody up here the police officer's going with you every freaking time this will never not work right you say safety to a police officer whose job you know their their, their entire you know being is wrapped around this concept they're going there they're going there immediately and that's where you're safe all right here's another one you become what you say this is a well demonstrated technique uh, robert cialdini talks about this in his book influence i believe um, there was a study in which uh, people were randomly asked to write a paragraph on a political belief that was opposite of their own belief so for example if they were against abortion they'd be asked to write something in favor of abortion and then they would check back with these people uh, in a year or whatever it was and they would just say what's your opinion on these topics and they found that the people who wrote an opinion that was opposite of their own opinion to a large extent many of them had actually adopted the opinion they wrote even though they knew when they were writing it it was just an experiment in which they were writing an, an opinion opposite of what they believed the point is and i think tony robbins would back this up as well the things you tell yourself you become all right that's a very important point what you tell yourself the way you use your words is who you become and it happens really quickly that's the part people don't get the moment you start talking in a certain way you adopt it and it happens just right then you know in the moment so you become what you say let's say you're a person who who in ordinary situation might be a little high-headed and you get stopped by the police the last thing you want is to be that guy you don't want to be the high-headed person who got stopped by the police so if the first sentence you make yourself say just as a system you know it's like maybe even have it written out and put it on your dashboard so you can say the exact words you know under stress you don't have to remember them if you start with this the mere fact that this comes out of your mouth puts you the person stopped by the police into the safety mode not because you thought about it before you said it but because saying it changes who you are instantly it just puts you in that mode so once you're in that mode you're going to you're going to make the all the little reflexive decisions that are consistent with the mode you just put yourself in and the the police officer already followed you to that mode he followed you to the high ground right away you want to use visual persuasion where you can uh, we're very visual creatures so uh, a couple things that happened was um, so when Terrell walked up no, when Ster Sterling walked up on the police officer he got close and he was big six was six police officer asked him to back up he um, Sterling should have known that his size is a big visual persuasion and he had his hoodie up I believe in the beginning the first thing he should have done is show his hands take his hoodie down keep his hands out of his pockets and keep a good distance from the police officer that's that's the visual persuasion next thing he should have done is agree with the police officer about the police officer's complaint so the police officer was, was said something along the lines of you don't see what's wrong here you don't see where you, you they what you did and instead of saying oh god you caught me this was really rude that uh, sterling said something like I was, it was just going to be in there a minute wrong 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 this is as wrong as you could be agree with the police officer even here's the key this is the important part you agree with the police officer even if you're a hundred percent positive they're wrong that's the hard part right and that's the part about making your ego a tool 
If you say, no, I'm not going to admit I'm wrong if I'm not wrong, that's not the way to play it, that you get your ass kicked. Now, you don't want to agree to a crime that you didn't commit, but, you know, because I could you know, guarantee you get a ticket. But you also don't want to disagree with the police officer. So here's a, a way to do it. You can always ask legitimate questions as long as they're not jerk questions. So you could say to the police officer, oh, in this case, you could say, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, officer. I, you know, you're totally right to be, uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, to come after me on this. Um, I wasn't thinking. I see how this looks. And I, I get it. I totally get it. Um, I, uh, I shouldn't have done this. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I totally should have done this. There's, there's all this parking out here. Even the, even the people who have disabilities, they have plenty of places to park right next to the door. I was only here for a minute. Keep those thoughts to yourself. What you say to the police officer is, I agree with you, sir, I agree with you. Now, if he accuses you, let's say, of doing something you didn't do, you say, oh, um, okay, I, I see why you would say that. That's not, that's not disagreeing. You say, oh, what, are, you're accusing me of this crime. Did you, see, did you see a black car pulling away from that crime scene? And the police officer says, yes, I did. And then you say, was it, was it my model? And the police officer says, well, I don't know, but I saw a black car leaving the crime scene, and here you are. And he goes, oh, I, well, I, could, I could certainly see why you're stopping me. Is there anything else I can answer for you to, to show you that I wasn't here? See that? That's not disagreeing with the officer. That's agreeing with his observation. Then you ask questions, and you very gently get him to, to make his case, and you find out where the hole is. So use questions where you can, but not jerk questions. You know, don't, don't go with the jerk questions, but legitimate questions. You know, what, officer, why is it that uh, you thought it was me? I, I, I'm wondering, and then he tells you, you go, oh, d- well, did you think that this was happening when you saw that? You know, and so you get him to come out a little bit, you have a conversation, you, you bond with him a little bit, you show respect, you do all those things, and with seven words, you can maybe keep yourself from getting beaten up. I would argue that if if a control group, I don't see this happening exactly, but if a control group tried doing this for a year against another group that didn't do this, I'll bet the people who did this for a year would have no uh, problems with police stops. Uh, oh, somebody said, did I cut you? Yeah, I see in the comments. Apparently somebody cut off a police officer and the police officer pulled them over and I saw in your comment that, that the way you approached it was instead of saying, here's what the mistake would be. Oh, I didn't cut you off. You had plenty of, you had plenty of room. Or I didn't have much room, so you know, I had to cut you off. You know, I, I thought you could get out of the way. Those would be all the mistakes. And the correct answer was, you saw in the comments, somebody said, oh, I'm sorry, did I, did I cut you off? And then the police officer says, yes. And you say, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize it was that close. I'm sorry, officer. And then you have a whole different situation. Uh, uh, all right. Somebody says that Brown knows all this. He wanted a confrontation. That sounds like the mind reader uh, hallucination. My assessment is, if you've ever been 23 years old, and most of you have, the assumption that a 23-year-old knows as much as you do at whatever age you are, that's, that's a tough assumption. My guess is that ego was in play, and he simply was not familiar with all of the elements of persuasion uh, in a way that would be useful to him. I doubt, I doubt he knew it at this level, that's for sure. Uh, he absolutely knew that not cooperating was more risk than cooperating. So he certainly knew enough to not get in trouble, but he didn't know it at a, at a deeper level. One assumes, just because he's 23. Um, 
All right. <laughs> I'm just looking at your comments here. <laughs> All right, was this uh, useful to you? Let, let me tell you the, uh, the way you should judge this. Um, I don't think it's likely that people will start using a, a method like this. And there, were, there was somebody who wrote, or a few people actually wrote on, on Twitter when I said I was going to talk about this topic. They said, well, this isn't complicated. If you just say, yes, officer, you're in good shape. You know, just, just agree with the officer, yes, officer, yes, officer. That's pretty good. If you, if you don't remember the seven words and you can't work safety into it, which is a far more powerful frame, yes, officer, that's going to get you 80% there, right? This will get you 100%, and I wouldn't take any chances with, you know, getting beaten up. So I think I'd go for 100%. Uh, did I watch the Chris Rock video? I did. So I mentioned that at the beginning. Chris Rock, if you, uh, if you Google something like Chris Rock, how to, how to avoid getting your ass kicked by the police, it is hilarious and, and weirdly useful because it's just telling people not to resist and do stupid things. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we've done enough for now, and <laughs> that's all for today. <laughs>